grateful for all of our visitors and uh, hello, and uh, all of you that are regulars as well. We could not do this without you. If you notice the, ch the change on the sign, it says Pastor Tibbs and Partners. You are the partners. Ministry does not happen without you. You rely on me, but guess what? I'm relying on you too. And the main thing I'm relying on is that when you hear God's word, that you put it into action, that you do what the Father requires of us. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to share your word with your sheep, God. May this be a word that nourishes their soul and gives them strength. But as I have said, God, your word says this, be not hearers of the word only, but doers of the word as well. So what we're about to hear, we're going to be required to do. So that means, most, that means that a lot of us might need to take notes when we come here to learn because how will we remember it all? And although the notes are on the app as well, God, and we can rehearse those, we just pray that the Holy Spirit would write these words upon our heart and bring them into remembrance so that we are able to do them. God, today's series, as you know, is about a clean heart and the right spirit. We always think it's somebody else. We always think it's the world, God, but it's us. We are the ones that need to have a clean heart and a right spirit. We are the ones that sometimes get off. We are the ones that sometimes, God, are not loving you with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our strength. Why? Because our heart gets clogged up with the cares and concerns of this world, and what should be uh, focused on you becomes focused on other things. David sinned greatly against you, God. But David's not alone in that category. For every single person in this room has also sinned greatly against you. Our concern is this, that we are not trapped in a pattern of sin, in a cycle of sin, that you would examine our hearts and make sure that they are clean, and that you would examine our spirits and make sure that it is the right spirit. Lord, I ask for your help this morning. I can't do this without you. I am weak and you are strong. I thank you for your anointing being upon me to speak your oracles, to speak revelation to your people. But I thank you for an anointing upon their ears and their hearts to hear what the word is and to perform what the word requires. So Lord, we love you and we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you all. Let's get into the word of God. Again, we're in the series called Clean Heart, Right Spirit. Today's message is entitled Create and Renew. Can you say that with me? Create and Renew. It's important that we understand that. Maintaining a clean heart allows us to host the Holy Spirit and seek God's will above our own. So the vast majority of you in here are believers, are Christians, you do love the Lord, but sometimes you can feel a little stuck. You can feel a little stuck as if the full purpose of God is just not active in your life. Like you're just not on fire like you used to be. You feel like you're kind of crawling through this life and not running as you ought to. We can get a little stuck. And last week, we talked about the importance of guarding our heart. I told the true story of my dryer at home and how the vents were so clogged that it was taking three times to dry the towels. And when the repairman came out, he took part of the dryer apart and went in the crawl space and replaced some of that, uh, some of those vent, some of the venting because it was just so full of lint that the dryer could not perform. So what, I'm, what God is wanting us to hear this morning is that sometimes our heart becomes so full of worldly things, so full of worldly concerns and worldly pursuits that when it's time for our spirit to function, it can't function in the way that it should. We should be living our lives just as Jesus did, right? Because as Christians, we are supposed to be Christ-like. And the thing that stops us from being Christ-like is if our heart is not fully set on loving God because a heart that does not fully love God produces a spirit that is lukewarm, produces a spirit that is sluggish. And my prayer this morning is that you would absolutely know that this message is for you. 
It's not for your neighbor. We got to move self-righteousness and pride out of the way. This message is for you. This message is not for your neighbor. Say this to me. This message is for me. Let's begin. Last week, we talked about our need to guard our hearts. Let's review that for a moment. We talked about when the Bible is talking about your heart, it's not talking about this muscle in your chest. It's talking about your inner man, your mind, your will, your soul, your understanding, your knowledge and thinking, your determination, your conscience. And we said that the heart is the headquarter of our appetite, of our emotions and our passion. So we have to be very careful that we guard it because if bad stuff gets into this heart, we'll begin to pursue those wrong things. That's why you got to guard it. You got to make sure nothing gets in this heart that doesn't belong because whatever comes into this heart will be produced in the spirit and you'll go after it and you'll chase after those things. So you must guard your heart. Then we were given instructions on how to guard the heart. Proverbs 4, 20 through 27 says this, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Don't lose sight of them. So many times we we sit in a church and we hear a sermon. And while we hear the sermon, we're like, okay, this is good. I'm enjoying this. But then as soon as we leave, we lose sight of it. Anyone willing to raise their hand? Because the preacher is raising his hand. And if I'm the one that sits down and prepares the word and preaches the word and I can walk away sometimes and not perform the word, then you can be just as guilty as well. So it's very important that you listen to what the proverb says. My child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart for they bring life to those who find them. What do they bring? Life to those who find them and healing to their whole body. Guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Avoid all perverse talk, stay away from corrupt speech, look straight ahead, and fix your eyes on what lies before you. Mark out a straight path for your feet, stay on the safe path, don't get sidetracked, keep your heart from following evil. So I had to repent this morning as I got the sermon ready because I was like, you know what? I didn't do that. I fail to do that. So what we must begin to understand is this, like when God sent a prophet to the people, they were required to do what the prophet said to the people. So we've got in a mindset in, 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 in the Western church or probably the whole church that when you hear a sermon, like it's just like kind of like a motivational speech. It's just to, to get to fill you up and to keep you going. But what we must remember is that if that man or woman is sent by God, then it's not their sermon. This isn't my sermon. This is a message from God, meaning that we're required to do whatever he says do. And where I failed was in these four points that we learned last week when it comes to guarding your heart. Now, I'm not saying I failed in in doing all of these things, but there's a couple of things that I want to point out that I did wrong. Number one, perverse talk and corrupt speech. So from last week to this week, did we fail to make sure that nothing came out of our mouth that was perverse or corrupt? And I'm not talking about just walking around cussing. I'm saying, did we allow negative words to come out against a person? Do we let negative words come out of our mouth against ourselves? Were we negative? Were we bitter? Were we angry? And did our speech do anything? Number two, this is another way to guard your heart. That's number one. Guard your heart from talking corruptly. Number two, wandering eyes. A failure to look straight ahead and see what's coming. So if you're going to guard your heart, your head's got to be up, right? Just like when you guard your car. You don't, guard, you don't drive your car like this, right? Because if you drive your car like this, you're going to damage your car, and you're going to damage someone else probably. So the Bible says guard your heart. Say this with me. Guard, guard. your heart. So in order to guard your, guard your heart, your eyes have to be look up to see what's coming, right? Because in this world, there is mass hysteria, mass destruction. We've got an enemy against our souls, and we've got to see what he's up to. So we, we cannot afford to have wandering eyes. Number three, here's where I messed up. 
a failure to map out the straight path to God for your life and to stay on it. So here's your homework. Remember, I said there's dis- different aspects of your life. You've got your spiritual health. You've got your uh, physical health. You've got your financial health. So the, the homework was to sit down at some point and map out your life and say, you know what? Here's what my spiritual life should look like. I need to be praying daily. I need to be in the word daily. I need to be worshiping the Lord daily. So everything we do in here is just a larger, a larger, not performance, but a larger display of what we should be doing by ourselves. We should absolutely be in scripture by ourselves. We should absolutely praise the Lord by ourselves and be in prayer as well. So we've got to map it out. Map out a straight path to God for your life and stay on it. So the Bible is full of verses that you can follow to make sure you have a good spiritual life, physical life, financial life, family life, all aspects of life. Number four, guard your heart by doing this. Sometimes we get sidetracked and follow after what God calls evil. Breaking the Lord's commandments, and this is all because there's a failure to love him with all of our heart. So looking back on last week, can you think of any moment where you weren't loving God with all of your heart? And what that moment would look like is when we did or said or thought something that wasn't in tune with Jesus Christ and being obedient to him. When we fail to love him with all of our heart, then what comes next is disobedience and sin. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. The, re- the way that we got our message, a uh, series title rather, was David prayed, Lord, create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. Why was David saying this? Because David sinned greatly against God, but David's not alone. We all sin. By a show of hands, how many have ever sinned in here? Every hand goes up, right? Because all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So David had to know what he did was a sin and that God saw it. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. The Lord, the God of Israel, says, I anointed you king of Israel and saved you from the power of Saul. I gave you your master's house and his wives and the kingdom of Israel and Judah. And if that had not been enough, I would have given you much, much more. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. So Nathan the prophet comes to David and says, he tells him a story and David gets furious and says, in this story, the man that stole the little lamb from the other man, he should be put to death and this other man should be repaid four times what he stole, what was stolen from him. And Nathan simply says says to David, you are that man. So here's what I want you to hear, church, okay? And this is not condemnation, but this is conviction for us all. When we read the Bible, we've got to understand that it's talking to us, right? I am that man. We are the ones that sometimes can be out of fellowship and communion with God. We are the ones that sometimes could have our hearts be soiled and our spirits not right. And God is, through his mercy and love, he sends a preacher, he sends a word to say, you are that man. Say this with me. I am that man. All right? So what that means is, I acknowledge, I acknowledge that I'm the one that, that can do wrong against God sometimes. It starts here, right? Pride has to be removed. You can't go around thinking that you're so holy and so righteous that you never mess up and you always get it right. None of us are like that. We, we become a terror in this earth, right? When you think that you're a Christian that never messes up, that never has to say you're sorry, that never falls short, then you just 
just become a terror in this earth. You're a terror in the home, a terror in the community because you're, we become self-righteous and full of pride. You can mess up. You can fall short, right? Because the Bible says that if any of us say that we are without sin, then we are liars, okay? So we can mess up. So God would not have sent this word to us, which is saying clean heart, right spirit, if we didn't need to hear it, right? This message is for us. It's for me. I need a clean heart and a right spirit. So when David was able to recognize that he was the man in the story that sinned against God, David repented. And this is what Psalms 51, 7 through 10 says. This is David talking once he recognized his sin against God. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. How many of you have been noticing in 2024, and it's happening very rapidly, that a lot of stuff that's been in the dark is being exposed. Preachers are being exposed. Government officials are being exposed. Everything that was in the dark and felt safe, God is taking a shovel to it and flipping it over into the light and saying, this is dirty, this is filthy, this has to be cleaned up, right? So as we clap and as we applaud this process, we've got to all be willing to say, God, do that in me. Take your shovel, dig it into my heart, flip over the ground, and whatever's happening in there that's dark and not right, let your light hit it so that I might be forgiven of my sins because here's what God does. His mercy, listen closely, I'm talking about you and I'm talking about me. His mercy for a while will leave that thing in the darkness. And what his hope is is that you will say and recognize, man, God, I've sinned against you. And I'm, I'm, I've sinned against you, God. Please forgive me. I repent. But there is just a matter of time where if we ignore the sin that's hidden in our lives, God will expose it. Church, can you say expose? So that's what Nathan came to do. Listen to me. David at that time had no plans of exposing what he did. He planned to just marry Bathsheba, have the new baby, and go on with his life. However, Nathan the prophet came to him to expose this sin. And here's what we must begin to understand. Once this happened, David was able to recognize and pray this prayer and say this, create in me, repeat this after me, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a loyal spirit within me. Because when your heart's not clean, your spirit can't be clean either. Because where the heart goes, the spirit follows. So if the heart turns against God, the spirit turns against God as well. And when I say the spirit, I'm talking about your spirit. When I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about your spirit. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. Remember this, where the heart goes, the spirit follows. So in 2 Samuel 11 and 1, we see this. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, David sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. However, David stayed behind in Jerusalem. Oh my goodness. So please listen. It's 2024. I don't know how much life you have left uh, in your body. I don't know how much time we have left on this earth, but the time is now to obey God. 
The time is now to be in right position where God wants us to be. So where we see David fail was, it was a time of war, and he was supposed to be there, but he was at the palace, right? So David's heart was not on the battlefield to do the work God called him to do. This is so important. I hope you're catching this. David's heart was not in the right place to be, to be doing the work God required him to do. David rather said, you know what? I'm going to take it easy. I'm going to take it easy, and I'm going to be at ease, and I'm going to be in leisure. So how many of us are guilty of this? It's so much easier, it's so much easier to be in leisure than it is to be doing the work of God. We're all guilty. All we have to do is pull out our phones, and our phones tell us how much time we spend on them. All we have to do is clock into God's, God's clock and say, okay, how many prayer hours and, 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 and hours in the Word and hours in loving people did I clock last week versus, versus social media, television, shopping, all those things, right? So I'm not saying those things are wrong, but they have to be prioritized, amen? Amen. They have to be prioritized. So David was supposed to be at war, but he was at leisure, we look at this country in the state it's in, and if you hope that, tw- if that November 2024 will change the course of America, you are highly mistaken. It is, not, it is not the vote that changes the country. It's the elect that changed the country. You are the elect. You are the elect of God. You are the sons and the kings and the priests of this, of this nation. And if we're at leisure, then the enemy is busy and he's tearing our country apart and there's nothing that Biden or Trump or any Republican or Democrat can do about it when it's our work. Jesus taught them how to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy what? Will be done. So listen to me. Wherever you see God's will not being done in this country, that means it's the responsibility of the children of God to pray and say, this is wrong, right? Abortion, this should not be right. Prostitution and child pornography and all these, these things are not right. Oh my goodness, we got so lazy that we're expecting the government to say, this is wrong, stop it. Are you serious? The government cannot stop demonic power. Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave and all the power that he had, he gave it to us. We are the rulers of righteousness in this earth. We are the kings and the priests. So I'm not saying don't vote. What I am saying is don't fail to be the elect of God. You are the ones that make a difference. You are the ones that his spirit lives on the inside of. So when your heart is out of position, you begin to crave wrong things. So church, this is why we can spend more time in leisure than we do in our word. Because when your heart is out of position, you begin to crave wrong things. Just the other morning, I hopped on social media before my Bible, and before I know it, a couple hours are gone. When's the last time you opened the Bible and a couple hours were gone? Right? That's such a rare occasion. Why? I'm telling on myself so that you be willing to tell on yourself as well, right? I'm confessing my mess so that you be able to confess your mess as, as well, right? Because listen, when your heart is not in the right place, it begins to crave wrong things. The Bible says, seek ye what? First. First the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. So whenever you don't put God first, your heart will begin to crave wrong things and your spirit will follow. David was out of position. He was supposed to be, he was anointed to be king, but instead he was at leisure and not doing what he was supposed to be doing. So listen to this. I caught this. The Holy Spirit gave me this this morning. I don't care how many times you read the Bible. God is all always able to open up new understanding when you read a passage. And please don't do this. Don't pick up the Bible like it's a magazine 
magazine or a regular book, when you pick up the Bible, you need to pray and say, God, this is a spiritual book. Like this is, I can't comprehend this with my natural mind. So as I read this word, Holy Spirit, will you help me to understand, bring it to light, the things of God so that I might have them. So listen to this revelation God gave me this morning about David. If David had been where he was supposed to be, he would have been in the position to celebrate the victory and give glory to God, which would have kept his heart on God. Now listen to this. Here's what happened. In the spring of the year, when kings normally go out to war, where are the kings? At war. David instead sent Joab and the Israelite army to fight the Ammonites. Listen to what they did. They destroyed the Ammonite army and laid siege to the city of Rabbah. So what does this mean? That if David had been there, he would have been celebrating the victory and giving God the praise. His heart would have been in the right place, in the right posture. His spirit would have been strong towards God because he would have said, God, you have given me the victory and we have sieged this city. But instead... Because it was the season for conquest and laying siege, which means taking taking ownership over something that doesn't belong to you, listen to what David did instead. He's a king. His heart should have been at war. He should have been at war. His heart would have been rejoicing towards God. He would have laid siege to the city. He would have been praising God for the victory, and he would have been in position. But because he was out of position, listen to what happens. And this is a lot of our testimony. So he is in the wrong place, but his heart is towards conquest. Maybe you'll catch it soon. His heart is towards conquest and laying siege and taking something that doesn't belong to them, right? In the right place, they defeat this enemy and take siege over this city. In the wrong place, He sees a woman that doesn't belong to him, sees something that doesn't belong to him. He wants her. He wants to, this is a conquest now, and he lays siege to her. This is my wife now. If his heart would, if he would have been in the right place, his heart would have been able to have these expressions in a holy way, right? It's a time of war, So I destroy an enemy, oh my gosh, I destroy an enemy and I take siege. But in the wrong place, he destroys Uriah. He kills a good guy and takes his wife's siege. Do you understand the danger? Do we, this is, this is God, do we understand the danger of being in the wrong place? It was the time for war and David was a king. Listen, you're the kings right now. And it's a time for war out there. But instead of of slaying the enemy and taking back what he's trying to take, what are your conquests right now? Come on, man. What are your conquests right now? And what are you sieging that doesn't belong to you? This is what we learn when our heart is in the, when, our, when we are in the wrong place. Listen, when your heart craves sinful things, it causes your spirit to oppose God and his desires. So the dirtier the heart, the more unwilling the spirit of a man is to obey God. Please hear this. Please hear this. When your heart becomes clogged with the things in pursuit of this world, your spirit grows unwilling to obey God. So David was supposed to be at war, but he's at the palace. His heart is clogged with leisure and pleasure. He's taking these random naps when he should be on the battlefield. And the Bible says that when he awoke from his nap, he began to walk on the top of his palace. And that's where he saw Bathsheba. If he had been in the right place, he would not have saw the wrong thing. I hope you hear that. Men and women, when you're on your phones or when you're out there, right? If you're in the right place, you can't see wrong things. If you're on the right website, you can't see wrong things. 
if you're watching right movies, you can't see wrong things, right? So when you're in the right place, you'll see right things. So you gotta, you, you have to rather pay attention to your cravings because your cravings determine where your heart is reaching for. So imagine your heart having an arm and that arm is a craving. So whatever your heart craves, it lets you know that that's the position of your heart. So the other morning when I woke up and I went reached straight for social media, it was the craving of my heart. And that's not a right craving, at least, church, can you say first? Something's wrong, that's my first craving. Can we be real today? If that's my first craving and that's the, that's, the ta- that's the place where I set my knees under a table and eat the longest, because whatever you eat, you become one with. Catch this. If you eat worldly things, you become worldly and then your spirit turns against God and you begin to walk in disobedience. Let's keep going. When the heart loses function, which is our main function of our heart is to love God, the spirit loses the desire to please God. Listen to this again. When your heart loses its number one function and purpose, which is to love God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, then your spirit begins to lose the desire to even please God. Do you hear what I'm saying? So that's why it becomes easier to do wrong things than right things. Why? Because my heart has craved wrong, and now my spirit doesn't even desire to please God anymore. How many are learning this morning? See, God wants to take us to some high places this year. But first, we've got to get our heart clean and our spirit renewed. Amen? So, when our heart is working correctly, it is in obedience to God because love is only proven through obedience. What is love proven through? Obedience. Obedience. So, when you love God, you have a willing spirit to obey. A clean heart equals a willing spirit. A clean heart equals a willing spirit, right? So that, let, that lets us know from the beginning, for David, I don't know what happened, but something happened in David's heart to make him say, you know what? I'm not even going to war. I'll send somebody else. That lets us know there was a condition of the heart that was happening already because what he did with Bathsheba was just an expression of desires that were already in his heart. And I tried to study this out and say, I wonder if he stayed just for Bathsheba, but I couldn't, I couldn't make that calculation because in the word it says that he noticed her and wondered who she was. So it seems to be the first time that he saw her. John 14, 15 reminds us of this, that if you love me, obey my commandments. Listen to this, church. The condition of our heart is made known through the words of our mouths. Words bring to life our spirit's intentions and desires, whether they be good or evil. So whatever comes out of our mouth is basically, the, is basically telling us what's on the inside of our heart. So listen to, listen to how we knew even before David sinned that something was going on in his heart. It's by what he said. In 2 Samuel 11, verses 2 through 4, it says this. He looked out over the city, noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath, and then he sent someone to find out who she was. So we knew his heart was wrong because of what he said. He had to get one of his men and say, hey, there's this woman over there. I want you to go find out who she is. So listen to what's coming out of his heart, right? Words are coming out of his heart that prove that lust is on the inside. Words are coming out of his heart that proves that something is wrong happening on the inside. So church, I won't say be careful of your words because you can't fix your words until you fix your heart. I won't say be careful of your words, but I will say this, pay attention to your words. Because whatever your words are saying, it's only displaying the heart. So 
Let's, let's look at something else David said to let us know his heart was in a wrong place. 2 Samuel 11, 14 through 15. Here's what David said. So the next morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and gave it to Uriah to deliver. The letter instructed Joab, listen to what David said. Listen to what came out of his mouth. Listen, station Uriah, this was Bathsheba's husband, who he had got pregnant, on the front lines where the battle where the battle is fiercest, then pull back so that he will be killed. Oh my goodness, right? That came out of David's mouth. But what was the source of it? His heart. When the heart's wrong, the words will also be wrong. But praise God for this. Listen, God corrects David and disciplines David. So Here's the point where we are in this message, in this word for us this morning. We recognize that sometimes that we can be in sin. And if we are in sin, the only thing that's going to save us is God's correction, right? God has to discipline us to get us where we should be and away from where we are. How many of you have children? Raise your hand if you've ever, if you have children, right? Raise your hand. Keep them high if you have children. All right, keep them high. How many of you, and I'm going to look around and see if this happens. I I don't think this is going to happen. How many of you, keep your hand up if you ever disciplined that child? Did any hand go down? I don't believe not one hand went down. All right, now we can put them down. So to have a child means that that child must be disciplined, right? Not out of anger, not because they upset us. They must be disciplined so that they will go the right way. Because to discipline is to teach and to bring correction, right? So that's what discipline equals. It's correction. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. So this is what we need. Nobody wants it, but we all need it, right? Nobody wants a spanking, but we all need it, right? This is going to hurt you more than it's going to hurt me. Then why do it? Don't do it. Save yourself the trouble. No, we needed that correction. Now, abuse is wrong. No parent should abuse their child. There's a fine line between abuse and discipline. But how many of you were glad for the good discipline that you received? The good, not the abuse, but the good discipline, right? Because the good discipline sets you on a right path. So here's where we are. Holy Spirit. Kimberly is gone. Holy Spirit, are you, able to, are you able to help us in this moment? Listen to this prayer. Pray this prayer. Well, first let me tell you what I'm about to pray because you might not want to pray it. Listen to this. And we're not done yet, Jim. I just want to, I just want to shift the atmosphere of, of this place right now so that God can do this. So listen to what we're about to pray, right? So if we're wrong, see, man, like, listen, I don't want to find out I'm wrong when I stand before God. Like, that's a bad time to find out that I, wasn't get, I didn't get it right. I would rather have the discipline of the Lord right now Then to stand before God and hear, depart from me, you worker of iniquity, you sinner, I never knew you. Off to everlasting judgment for you. I don't want that. I'll take the whooping back here, right? So if I'm living wrong, then I'll take the spanking. I got it coming, right? So fix me right here and right now. So that's what the discipline of the Lord does. So listen to how, see, listen, God loved David. He said, this is a man after my own heart. It broke God's heart that David sinned like that. But, but God wasn't done with David. Say this with me. God isn't done with me. So he's not done with you yet. Come on, you got to hear this. See, sometimes we get so deep into sin that we're like, God, I know he's done with me. There's no, he won't receive me back. He, he, he can't fix this. Yes, he, no, no, you can't fix it, but God can. So you've got to get into a place where you say, okay, God, like 
I've done wrong. Like, this is me. I'm the one that sinned against you. And I need you to discipline me now so that my soul might be saved forever because I know that you love me. Say this with me, church. I know that he loves me. So when you know that he loves you, you understand that whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. Come on. Who the Lord loves, he brings correction to. And we can't run from the correction. Oh my goodness, listen to me. When you run from correction, all you're doing is running to the end of your life to stand before a holy God as a sinner. It's better to receive the correction that's way back here so he can fix the direction of your soul so that you might walk that narrow path that leads to him. Church, are you willing to say this with me? Correct me, God. Bring me the discipline that will save my soul. Listen to me. Listen to me. I know some of your parents beat your tail, but it kept you out of jail. Do you hear what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? When they spanked you for stealing cookies, you ended up not stealing cars. Do you understand what I'm saying? Correction does you well back here, but now you're too big to spank. Now you're too big for your parents to say you're doing this wrong. Some of our parents are gone. So all we have now is a heavenly father who we can say, Lord, if I'm wrong, then correct me. Lord, if I'm wrong, then fix me. And the thing about being wrong is there's always three entities that know you're in wrong. You, the devil, and God. You know you're wrong when you're wrong. The devil knows you're wrong. You know how I know the devil knows you're wrong? Because the Bible says that he is the accuser of the brethren. So every time you mess up, the devil's running and saying, he, he messed up, he sinned, he's living it. You need to kill him. Your word says he should die. And God also knows when we're wrong. So when all our wrong is exposed, sin is never hidden. Sin is always out there and wide open. So what we need to begin to pray is say, God, you know I'm wrong. I know I'm wrong. The devil knows I'm wrong. So fix me, correct me. And this is what happens in 2 Samuel chapter 12, verses 9 through 14. Listen to the correction. Because before you ask for it, you, you need to know, number one, it's hard. God's correction is hard. And some of you, some of you think, some of you that think that you run into a bad spell of luck, you think that, man, I can't catch a break. But really what you need to evaluate is say, wait a minute. Is this the correction of God? Like, am I, do I feel stuck here because he just won't let me advance without being corrected? Listen to what God said to David through the, Nathan, through the prophet Nathan. Why then have you despised the word of the Lord and done this horrible deed? For you have murdered Uriah the Hittite with the sword of the Ammonites and stolen his wife. From this time on, your family will live by the sword because you have despised me by taking Uriah's wife to be your own. This is what the Lord says. Because of what you have done, I will cause your own household to rebel against you. I will give your wives to another man before your very eyes, and he will go to bed with them in public view. You did it secretly, but I will make this happen to you openly in the sight of all Israel. Then, church, can you say then? After this correction, the next verse in the Bible is verse 13, and the first word of verse 13 says, then. So we got all this correction, all this discipline, and then the next word is then. Then David confessed to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. So you need to pray for the correction of God. Why? So that you can be the one that says, God, I had this coming. I can't hide this thing anymore. I have sinned against you. Listen, church. 
it's not just about the big sins. No, you're not murdering anyone and perfectly you're not with anyone's spouse. So it's not just about the sins of commission, committing sins against God. It's about the sins of omission. And the sins of omission are those things that you omit. The Bible says this, if you know that it is good to do something and you don't do it, that is sin. Do you hear me, church? It's not just about the big ones. It's us. It's humanity that categorizes sin as big sins and little sins. We say, at least I'm not doing this or at least I'm not doing that. But God, Jesus hangs upon the cross and says, it was all sin and I'm dying for it all. Not just the big sins with the little white lies that you tell. When you don't treat your wife right, that's a sin right? When you are greedy, that's a sin. When you fail to pray and read your word, these are right things to do. That's a sin. Now listen to me. I'm not trying to elevate your sin consciousness. I'm trying to elevate our righteous consciousness. I'm saying there's, there's right things to do that we can't fail to do because that is also sin as well. But thank God after the correction, David was able to confess his sin and say, I have sinned against the Lord. And listen to how Nathan replied, yes, but the Lord has forgiven you and you won't die for this sin. Nevertheless, because you have shown utter contempt for the word of the Lord. That's the great sin. Oh my goodness. It's not the murder. It's not the adultery. The greatest sin that we can commit is utter contempt against the word of the Lord. We know what the word of the Lord says to do, but we fail to do it. That is utter contempt of the word of the Lord. By doing this, your child will die. This is the child that David produced with Bathsheba in sin. David prayed that God would change his mind, but God's mind was set, and the child did die. But after the child died, David got up off the floor. He washed and anointed himself. He sat down to eat. And they said, David, I mean, why are you doing all this? Before the child died, you prayed and, and, and now you're up and you're moving around and you're rejoicing. He said, listen, that child is gone. He said, I, it cannot come back to me, but one day I will go to it. So that's the promise to you mothers that had stillborn children, that that child that maybe you did not get to see, you will see. You will see that child again. Those of you that have lost loved ones and they died in Christ, you will see them again. And here's where we come to an ending here. And Kimberly and Jim, if you want to trade places, you can. Here's where we come to our ending. So a broken heart equals a sorrowful spirit. So when your heart is not clean, it needs to be broken. Do you hear what I'm saying? A dirty heart is a prideful heart. A dirty heart is a prideful heart. It's a heart that walks around saying, ah, I got it, I'm good. But no, every dirty heart needs to be broken and every wrong spirit needs to become sorrowful. It says this, uh, or here's what, what I, I feel to say. David's heart had become filthy, soiled with sinful desires and actions. His spirit was no longer loyal to God. He was in error and disobedience. So what was his prayer for his filthy heart and wrong spirit? Listen to what David says, Psalms 51, 7 through 10. Purify me. Listen to David. Look, look at, picture this. Close your eyes for a moment. Picture all this has happened. David's sin has been exposed. God has brought great correct correction. He's put a curse upon his family. David's child has died. David's been caught with dirty hands, a soiled heart, a wrong spirit. And Psalms opens up our eyes to a private moment where we get to see 
what David said to God after all this. Close your eyes and listen to your heart. Listen with your heart. May these words echo in your heart so you know how to repent. Listen to what he says. Purify me from my sins and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have broken me. Now let me rejoice. Don't keep looking at my sins. Remove the stain of my guilt. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within me. Open your eyes again. David goes on to say this. You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. Listen to what David knew. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart. What kind of heart does God not reject? A broken and repentant heart heart. That's all you got to do to get close to God again. I know you, we can feel dirty sometimes, like he doesn't want anything to do with us. But when you have a broken heart and a broken uh, a spirit, then that becomes a welcome mat for God to walk back into your life. And we must understand that there's the work of the Holy Spirit that has to happen. Psalms 51 verses 10 through 12 say this, create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. But listen to what he said right after that. This is what was the most important thing to David. He didn't say, don't take your kingdom from me. He didn't say, don't take your riches from me. Don't take the warriors from me. Listen to what David said. Do not banish me from your presence. And don't take your what? Holy Spirit from me. He's like, God, you can have it all. You can have it all. I'll go back to the fields. I'll go back to being a shepherd boy. All I want is you. All I want is you. Verse 12 tells us, he says this, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. So when your heart is clean, you find joy in the salvation of God. When your heart is impure, you find joy in unclean things. Do you hear that? And listen to this about his spirit. He says, and make me willing to obey you. So when your heart is right, everyone, when your heart is right, your spirit will be right. When your heart is right and clean, then you'll be able to have a spirit that is ready and willing to obey God. But first, if you sin, there must be heartbreak over your sin. Like, oh God, this sin has broken me. It has broken my heart. And, and listen, when that doesn't happen, man, when, when, when you commit the sin, and if that doesn't break your heart, then God has to come along with correction and break your heart. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, for those of you that have the Holy Spirit, whenever you sin, you should feel terrible right after. You're like, oh, man, like, why did I do that? You just feel so dirty, right? Because the, the Holy Spirit is with you and is bringing that conviction on your life. But when you walk so far away from the conviction of the Holy Spirit and sin doesn't bother you anymore, that's when it's time for correction to show up. And so since your heart wasn't repentant back here, now God's got to break it right here. Do we understand that? He has to break your heart. And listen to what David said. Listen to what David said. Because his family was cursed now. He lost the child. Listen to David's confession. And I'm, and I'm almost done here. I'm almost done here. Okay, it's Psalms 51. Chap, I'm sorry, Psalms chapter 51, verse 8. Listen to what he said. Oh, give me back my joy again. You have what? 
broken me. If he would have repented way back there, he would not have gotten broken like that. But he sinned and then hid his sin and then tried to, to continue being a king with a dirty heart and a wrong spirit. Listen, you are kings and you are priests, but we can't do it with a dirty heart and a wrong spirit. So we must ask God to examine us. We must ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit because that is exactly who it takes to help us. John chapter 16, verses 5 through 15. Listen to what Jesus said. But now I am going away to the one who sent me, and not one of you is asking where I am going. Instead, you grieve because of what I've told you. But in fact, it is best for you that I go away, because if I don't, the advocate, the helper, the Holy Spirit won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, so listen up, church. This is what the Holy Spirit does on the inside of you so you don't have David moments, right? And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness. So we have to have a knowledge of what sin is and what righteousness is and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. He will tell you about the future. He will bring me glory by telling you what he receives from me. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will tell you whatever he receives of me. So it is the Spirit of God that enables a man to perform his will. By maintaining a clean heart, we can host the Holy Spirit. A clean heart seeks God's will above its own. We must come to a point of getting unstuck. Let's stand to our feet this morning. What you must understand is that a clogged heart slows down your spiritual progress. No different than a clogged heart can lead to a heart attack in the natural. A clogged heart causes the heart not to function as it should, and it gives you less cardiovascular energy and strength. I'm telling you, a clogged spiritual heart will slow down your spiritual progress. You won't be the man or woman of God that God requires you to be because your heart has been weakened and clogged with the things of this world. The thing that clogs our heart is when we love the things of this world more than we love God. What clogs our heart is when we are, and, and when a, with a clogged heart, we have a spirit that will chase after sinful things instead of have a willingness to obey our God. And there's only one way to get a clog out of your heart, and that is through repentance. In Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 11, we see that God has Moses come up to a mountain, Mount Sinai, and the children of Israel are two months out of, out of Egypt. But now they're camped in the wilderness and they're stuck there. Some of you feel stuck right where you are in your spiritual progress. Yes, you're saved, but you feel kind of stuck. Like I'm not progressing, I'm not growing, I'm not serving, I'm not doing those things that I know God is calling me to do. I feel stuck. And you, we can be out of the bondage of sin, but still in the wilderness, away from God's tangible presence. So... Moses sent a word to the people saying, listen, God wants to make you a special covenant. He wants you to be his special treasure on the people of earth. And he wants you to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And they said, okay, God wants that. We will obey him. But then God told Moses that he's going to come and visit the people in a thick cloud. And he's going to speak to them. But first, it was important that they consecrate themselves, which, which meant they had to wash their clothes because God does not come near in his holiness, in his glory, the, the, the dirtiness, the foulness 
of sinful people. We have to be willing to wash our hearts. So Father, I've given them this message and it's so important that we don't think it's the person on our left or the person on our right that needs to get right with you, God, that needs to be searched. We need to understand that, Lord, it is us. We are the ones that need to have our hearts examined and we are the ones, God, that need for you to bring us correction if we are wrong. So Father, we're asking now in Jesus' name that as we soon gather at this altar, God, that you would come near to us and prepare us to wash ourselves, God, and to be made clean with your blood. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Kyle, can you please get the communion, please? So this, this altar call is for all of you that are willing to say, God, search me. Search me, God. Search my heart. Some of us know that we're, that we're in wrong, we're in error. And remember, it's not about the, the sins that you think are big that you're committing, but it's even those small things that 